Hello, um, my name is Barney Della. I'm a software team lead at Canon Medical. Um, we're one of the sponsors of this meetup. Um, we're based down in Leith, um, and we write software for medical scanners like this. And today I'm going to talk to you about strong types in C++. So, if I'm going to talk about strong types and strong typing in C++, it's probably a good idea if we first establish <coughs> what a strong type is. And to answer that, I guess we need to know what is a type in the first place. Um, we often talk about types in software, but what do we mean by type? Um, a type is really a way of organizing data and associating functionality with that data. Um, we then have a type system, which gives us a set of rules for organizing these types, for specifying how we can convert from one type to another, um, when we do any checking on what types are valid to be passed into um, which APIs. And C++ is, at least in part, an object-oriented language, um, and we define classes to represent our data and our functionality. And very often in C++ we will think about types and classes as being the same thing. Um, and of course we also have the native built-in types, um, float, int, bool, that kind of thing. Um, so, I'm now going to have a look at how we use types in programming in general uh, before we move to C++. So, this is Python. Um, Python is a dynamic language um, and it's also, at least in part, weakly typed. Um, a lot of Pythonistas consider themselves to be a strongly typed language because they're compared to JavaScript, but it's fairly weakly typed compared to C++. Um, so it's dynamic, which means that we can do things like this. X starts off being an integer, then becomes a string, then becomes a float, and that's fine. Um, the type of X changes dynamically as the program is running. Um, and here's another example from <coughs> Python um, showing how it's weakly typed. So we have a function here, separate by comma, um, and it has two parameters, S1 and S2, and notice that we don't have to say what the type of those is. Um, it just takes in two values and it adds in a comma in between them. Um, so here we are calling the function, we're passing in x and y, and the output is x comma y, as we'd expect. Um, and here we're doing the same function, passing in two integers into the function. Um, so we'll take in the value 1 for the point. Anyway, taking the value 1 for S1 and then adding a comma to it and then adding 2 on the end. And does anyone know what happens if you try this? Exception, exception yes. You get a runtime exception. It throws. Um, it fails at runtime because we use the wrong type. Um, if we wanted to guard against this, we would need to add in a check on the type of the input in the function, um, put in a try accept block, something like that and then add unit tests to make sure that all that code is correct. So Python is a weakly typed language, at least in that regard. We can't write an API that prevents us from passing in the wrong type. Um, the checking happens at runtime. And in many ways, this is a feature of the language rather than a defect, because we don't have to think about the type system at all as we're writing programs. We can develop small programs very quickly um, JavaScript was explicitly developed for that purpose. Um, and JavaScript these days is used on large-scale projects. Um, but as programs get bigger, it becomes harder to keep all of the types in your API in your head, um, and that becomes problematic. So we're now seeing developments such as TypeScript, uh, where typing has been added to JavaScript, uh, at least bolted, <laughs> bolted onto JavaScript. Um, so yeah, as programs become too big, um, we, we can no longer keep APIs in our heads. Type safety makes it more likely, uh, the lack of type safety makes it more likely that we'll call an API with a value that we shouldn't, uh, and then we'll get a runtime crash. So how do languages like C++ solve this problem? Um, so I'll show you the same function in C++. Um, here again, a function that takes in two parameters, and this time it's taking in two strings, S1 and S2, um, and adds them together and puts in a comma between them. So here we pass in hello and world, we get back hello, comma, world, as we would hope. 
Uh, and of course, the return type is specified in the API. It's also a string. Um, and what happens if we try and pass in two integers to this function? Does anyone know? It's a compiler error. Yep. Um, now, the program itself is ill-formed. It cannot be compiled. The compiler has added a level of <coughs> testing to our code. We don't need to remember that the API takes in strings and make sure we only pass in strings. Um, the compiler understands that for us. We don't need to write tests to make sure that it works okay when we don't pass in strings because we can't write that code in the first place. The compiler will prevent it from existing and being deployed. Um, the machine is doing thinking that we don't need to do, which is great. So, fantastic. C++ is a strongly typed language, um, which was kind of the goal of my talk. So. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, Joe asked me to do this talk and told me I had about an hour. Um, I think I'm about eight minutes in. I thought an hour was a bit much, um, cause seeing as basically we're kind of done. So I did prepare some filler just to fill up the time. So I'm quite a big fan of astronomy. Um, <laughs> this is the constellation Orion, which you can see not really this time of year. Um, it's in the southern sky in winter. Um, I like it a lot. I have it tattooed on my arm. Um, and yeah. It's one of the great delights of a Scottish winter, seeing that in the southern sky. Um, this is Mars, um, the red planet. Um, and I absolutely love that we have a robot there right now. The Curiosity rover driving around, sending back photos. Um, it even has its own Twitter feed. I know it's just a person in NASA doing it, but I like to pretend. Um, this is an actual photo of Mars taken by the Curiosity rover, which is, I don't know, just amazing. Uh, here's another one. I, yeah, I'm always just blown away that we have this. There's one of Titan as well that the lander took recently, which was brilliant. Um, I didn't put the photo up, it's ridiculously low res, but you can see some rocks. And they found that there are lakes on Titan uh, made of eth methane and ethane. And NASA and the European Space Agency have been considering sending a yacht to sail on the lakes of Titan. And I hope that I live long enough to see that, because that's brilliant. Um, this is the rover itself. Um, I'm not quite sure how it takes its selfies. Is it just on this? Is there a big pole here or something that takes them? But that's a selfie of, of the rover taken on Mars. Um, and just recently, there was an announcement that an actual water lake had been discovered beneath the southern Martian pole. Um, not water in the frozen form, but actual liquid water. Um, we have similar ones under Antarctica of fresh, fresh water, which have been there for 10, 20,000 years. This one's probably been there for a few billion if it is there. Um, but the Curiosity rover is in the Gale Crater, which is quite a long way from the pole. Um, and there had been a plan to send um, a lander to the pole, and it was going to be supported by the Mars Climate Observer satellite. Um, I did a bit of Googling, and it turns out that the uh, Mars um, orbiter crashed into Mars. And it turns out that it crashed because of a software error. Interesting. Um, the project itself, cost $320 million, um, and it was destroyed by software. Now, I write medical software for a living, so serious failures caused by software that's badly written is quite interesting to me. Um, we're not going to lose a lander into the surface of Mars. With my software, we can lose patients, we lose real people. So I did a bit of research. Why did this satellite crash? What, what kind of bug was it? This was an interesting um, headline in one of the articles I read. The metric system has been used by NASA for many years. <coughs> now, the US by and large still uses the imperial system, feet and inches, that kind of thing, um, as do we in the UK, but I've never heard of anyone using the imperial system in mainstream science, but they do in the US. <laughs> it turns out NASA don't. NASA use the metric system. Uh, and they wrote an API um, that was expecting metric units. Um, but they outsourced some of their software um, to Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin called this API. And Lockheed Martin were working in Imperial units. Huh. So I didn't find the actual API. Um, I was on holiday when I wrote these slides and I couldn't bother Googling. Um, but I would hazard a guess that it was something like this. So there's a function at the top here um, that NASA wrote. Um, obviously, it's not the code that NASA wrote, but, um, and it takes in a mass, and it expects that mass to be in kilograms. And then there's some code at the bottom that Lockheed Martin didn't write, 
um, which calls this function and it passes in a mass in pounds. And then it uses the velocity to work out what it's doing, gets it badly wrong and slams into the surface of Mars, wasting $320 million. And meaning we don't have anything there, they can go to the pole and see if there's a real lake with any life in it. But I thought I said earlier that C++ was strongly typed. We have compiler support to prevent these kind of problems. The trouble is that both kilograms and pounds are represented as doubles. The type of kilograms is double, the type of pounds is double. They are the same type. So we obviously could write unit tests to catch this, um, but then we're back to the problem that we have with Python, where we don't have compiler support to catch these kind of problems, we're back to writing tests for um, instead. And the great advantage of using languages like C++ is that you do have compilers to help you catch bugs. So I said before that types are a way of collecting data and functionality together, but they are so much more than that. Types are compiled away, they don't exist in assembler, they don't exist in machine code. Uh, like so many features of high-level languages, types are there for us to use. They're to help us understand our code. High-level languages make it easier for us to understand what the code that we write is doing. And a type system helps us to understand our own code. Types encode meaning. The software that we create is, is vast and complex. Um, if you're just starting uni, you're going to discover this. Um, you start at uni writing little small programs of 10, 20 lines, then you get a job and you're faced with a program that's got a couple of million lines. And you have no chance of understanding it. We need all the help that we can uh, to get to grips with the software that we face. And when we see a function like this, what meaning can we extract from it? We can guess that it probably calculates a velocity, if it's well named. Um, it hopefully takes in a mass, um, these, and it calculates a velocity, which it returns. And these are both represented as doubles. So we know how these numbers are represented. We don't know what they represent. We don't know what they mean. Wouldn't it be much nicer if we had an API like this instead? Now we know that it takes in some kilograms and it returns <coughs> meters per second. This tells us what the values are, not how they're represented in memory. And more importantly, the compiler sees these as different types. So now, um, it would see pounds and ounces as different types to kilogram. It would see doubles as different types to kilograms. So if we had an API like this from NASA, then when we have this code in Lockheed Martin and they try and pass in a value in pounds, it does not compile. They might even change their code to use a similar system. And now we'll get a really good error because you certainly can't pass some pounds to a function expecting some kilograms and you'll get a nice error from your compiler to that effect, hopefully. Um, in fact, wouldn't it be even nicer if we could pass in a value in pounds or ounces and have them magically convert into kilograms because it's actually a fairly simple conversion to go from pounds and ounces to kilograms. So if we step back and think about what these types are, we know what they mean, kilogram, meter per second, pounds, and we've also established that we're encoding them as double precision or single precision floating point numbers. And the obvious way to achieve that in C++ uh, is to use a type alias. Um, with this line here, we can create a type called kilogram, which represents a double. Perfect. Um, then we can do the same thing for pound, and now we've also got pound representing uh, a double as a distinct type. And if we write this again, uh, now we're trying to pass in a value in pounds into a function expecting kilograms, it shouldn't compile, so brilliant. But it does. Uh, and that's because kilogram and pound are just pseudonyms for double and pseudonyms for each other. So this hasn't solved our problem at all. So we need something more complicated. So we need to create a new type that wraps up the double uh, that we're going to use. Um, we can construct it with a double, we can get the double from it, and internally it owns one. Obviously, we can write a lot more code here that will work with move semantics and various other things like that. But this is the basis of it. Um, this will do the job we need. Um, and we can do a similar thing for pound. And now we definitely have two distinct types. We've created two different classes for them. Um, 
So here they are, kilogram and pound next to each other, um, and they're almost exactly the same. They have a different name, so that goes through to the constructor. Um, but if we had to create other ones, we're doing ounces, we're doing meters, we're doing meters per second, we're going to write this code a lot. So we probably want to template it um, so that we can create these a little bit easier. And if we're doing that, we might as well template with a double because we might want to have other types representing an int or a floating point number, something like that. So this is the template. Um, the template of an underlying type. Uh, we have a store one of them as a value. We can construct it and we can get the underlying type. Um, this is based on Jonathan Bakara's really very good uh, Fluent CPP blog and GitHub. Um, pretty much most of the rest of this talk is just stolen straight from him. Um, and I'll give you a link to the end to it. Um, cool. So now we can use our template like this. We can construct a kilogram, um, template it on double, so that the underlying type will be double in the template. Uh, and we can do a similar thing for pound. Um, great. Except kilogram and pound are now synonyms again. <laughs> we're back where we were just before we created the, the wrapper. So rather than being synonyms for double, they're now synonyms for a templated type, templated on double. We've just made things even more confusing, but not really solved anything. Um, to solve this, uh, we need to use another parameter, not just a double, to distinguish one type from another. Uh, we want to parameterize name type itself. Um, and we do that with a template parameter. So um, we need to use a type that's unique um, across the whole program. Uh, so we can do something like this. We just create a new type, um, <coughs> kilogram parameter, and pass it in as the second template parameter to our, um, to our using statement. And, and that works. Note that we don't need to use this phantom tag up here, which is why I've got a phantom tag. It doesn't do anything. It's purely there to disambiguate one type from another. So now we can create. Um, just this one. Right. So we can create similar. We can create genuinely unique types like this, and then do a similar thing for pound. Um, they are genuinely unique, and we have a nice template that we can reuse for other things as well. So in fact, we can go one better. We can declare our phantom type inline like that. Um, so now we can create a strong type wrapping up another type in one line. So we have a really nice way of creating unique types that wrap simple native types in C++. Um, we can encode meaning really quite nicely, uh, and we can encode that meaning in a way that the compiler understands. Kilogram and pound are both stored as doubles, but they are distinct types. So we now have two advantages. The compiler will recognize them uh, as different types and thus catch potential bugs for us. But the types also have meaning, which makes it easier for us to reason about and understand our own code. OK, so we have this nice type called kilogram. But wouldn't it be nice if we could add in support for, say, grams and milligrams in a meaningful way? So I'll show you how to do that next. This is some code using std chrono. Um, it's part of the standard library. Uh, so here, print seconds um, takes a value in in seconds. Uh, but in the main function, we are passing in a value in hours. And yet, it prints out 14,400 when we pass in four hours. Um, somehow, the hours get magically turned into seconds by the time it reaches the function body. Um, and the standard template library offers us a nice mechanism for doing this um, and for describing ratios between things, which is std ratio. This represents a ratio of three to two. Um, and this is what std chrono uses. Um, this here is the ratio that's used to represent seconds to minutes. And actually, these are the same things. If you miss out the second one, it just defaults to one. So that's ratio 60 to 1. So if we go back to our definition of name type that we had before, um, we're going to add in a new template parameter that represents a ratio. So we do it like this. Um, but how do we use it? What we're going to do is define a, a base type 
with a ratio of one to one, and then define other types as multiples of the base. So this is what we're aiming to get, something like this, where a gram is a name type templated on mass and a ratio of one, and a kilogram is a name type, again, templated on mass, but with a ratio of a thousand to one. Standard library also gives us these nice stood kilo, stood milli, all these things. Um, it's just the same thing as stood ratio of a thousand to one. So the only difference here is the ratio. The phantom tag is the same, the underlying type is the same. So almost the same type, but not quite. And we can write a conversion function quite easily. This is basically just a cast function. Um, we define an operator that convert from one type to another. And this only works if the other type we're trying to convert to has the same underlying type, the same phantom tag, but just a different ratio. Um, and all we need to do is construct, uh, we get our one, we multiply it. Maths. I got a degree in maths, it was a long time ago. Um, and with that, we can then convert from um, grams to kilograms. And because the phantom type tag here um, is important, we can't convert from, say, meters to grams. We can convert meters to kilometers, but not from kilometers to kilograms, because they'll have different phantom tags. Um, but this scheme only works if we remember to put the stood ratio one in the base unit. And this can become a bit cumbersome. And it's also a boilerplate that we don't want to have to write every time we're using these. Maybe we're <coughs> using a strong type that doesn't even need a ratio. So we can solve this by renaming our named type template to name type impl, and then writing an alias for name type, which just uses um, a ratio of one to one, like that. So now if you don't want to use a ratio at all, we can just use name type as before and it will have a ratio of one without us having to think about it. And then, yeah, Simon. So you're doing that rather than just using a um, default template? That would also work. Uh, the question is, is there a reason why I'm doing that rather than using a uh, default template argument? Um, no, that would also work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are many ways to solve the problem. If there is a reason, I can't think of it just yet. Um, cool. So now we can create a similar template um, called multiple of. I haven't shown it here because it's much the same. Um, and this allows us to write code like this now, where gram is a name type on double, and then kilogram is a multiple of gram with stood kilo. Um, and we can go a step further. There is a simple linear ratio for converting between pounds and kilograms. Um, it's 56,699 to 125,000, um, roughly. So we can create a new type called pound, um, which is a multiple of kilogram with that ratio. Um, this is a distinct type from kilogram, but if we pass it to a function expecting kilograms, then the conversion operator will be invoked and it will generate a value in kilograms for us based on the value of the pounds. So this is even better than a compilation error. We get compiled conversion. So yeah, we can use this, and it will work in a function that expects kilograms. So I'm just going to put the ratios to one side for a moment um, and look at another thing that we want to do with these types. The strong types that we've created so far um, are all well and good but they completely hide the underlying value away. You know, the double is just hidden completely. Is that a problem? So imagine we wanted to add two kilograms <coughs> together. We would need to get the underlying doubles, add them, and then create a new kilogram from the result. And this might not be a problem the first time you write it, but it would get annoying if you need to do it a lot. But it's worse than that. It forces the user, forces the reader, to understand how kilograms are defined under the hood, how they're implemented. Um, in order to add two kilograms, I need to call get to get a double, add it to the double from the other one, call a constructor and pass the result in. All I'm trying to do is add some things together. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could just write this? It's cleaner, less cluttered, and it does what we want. I want to add two kilograms together. We don't have to think about how they're embedded under the hood at all. Um, and of course, it's not just addition. 
um, be good to have multiplication, division, etc., etc. We want to be able to select what types of operations we expose as well, because for kilograms, for example, we probably don't want to allow multiplication, but for other types, we probably do. So it'd be nice if we could create some sort of policy that our strong type could inherit from, so that we could say kilogram is addable and subtractable. So it could inherit from it uh, and find the behavior it needs um, in a base class. So we want to put the adding logic, the division logic, the multiplication logic into a base class. And this base class can be reused by any type that we want that follows this scheme. But in order to do that, the base class needs to know the actual underlying type, in this case it would be double, in order to perform that operation. So it'd be really nice if we could write something like this, kilogram, multiplogram, it's a kilo, and it's addable and subtractable. But how can we make this work, given that addable needs to know about the fact that this is using doubles under the hood? So this is a job for the curiously recurring template pattern. Um, this pattern allows us to create a base class that knows about derived classes. So here we create our main type inheriting from addable. Addable itself is then templated on named type, like that. And addable in turn inherits from a base class called CRTP, the curiously recurring template pattern. And CRTP is also templated on the name type, and it provides a cast back to name type. Addable then uses this cast in order to create a plus operator, and this plus operator is then inherited inside name type. Yeah, I didn't, get, I didn't understand it at all when I first saw it. Did anyone understand it? Yeah, I'll put you some. <laughs> cool. The nice thing is it does work. Um, so now we can create a bunch of policies for our types like this. We can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and just add them into our list. Yeah? Uh, are you effectively adding a virtual pulp to every arithmetic operation in the code? Yes. Okay. No, it's not a virtual call, it's done the compile time. Yeah, because it's static. Ah, it is indeed static, yes. I have a separate talk to give on premature optimization. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yes, we can create these policies like this. <coughs> Um, we can make things comparable, like this. We just define all the operators we need in order to compare one type against another, or well, instances of one type against other instances of that same type. We could make a type printable, but that's slightly more complicated. Um, we can make the policy quite easily um, with a helpful print function that prints out the underlying type to a stream, but now we've got to call print rather than use a stream operator or something like that. Um, it'd be really nice if we could do something like this. We create a name type and then we dump it into a stream. But stream operators are declared outside the class, not inside it, for reasons I'm not going to go into. So what we need is some sort of function that does use the stream operator, that doesn't use the stream operator and has something inside it. Um, but what goes inside the function? Well, that's easy. We've already defined a print function in our printable base class. So inside our stream, we can just call it. Um, if our type does not inherit from printable, then this will not compile because there will not be a print function. Um, and if there is, then it will be called and it will work. Okay. Um, I said earlier that it'd be great to be able to write code like this, where we actually inherit from addable and subtractable. Um, we know how to create the policies now that we're going to use. 
but how do we write name type such that it can inherit from multiple policies? And with variadic inheritance, that's actually quite easy. Um, although if you don't know the syntax, it's weird. So firstly, name type uses variadic uh, templates. So it has just a list of policies that come after the phantom tag. Um, and it's then inherits from those policies um, using variadic inheritance. So each policy is templated on the name type. And obviously the name type itself is, is templated. And then we do the inheritance for each policy. Um, and so the name type ends up inheriting from every policy in the list. And that's it. Uh, name type now implements each policy that it's passed, um, if any, that are listed um, in the list of template, in the arguments of the template. So here I created a strong type at the bottom, which is addable and subtractable. And that will work. Okay. Um, I'll show you another nice feature that you can use um, with user-defined types. It's really quite easy to add in user-defined literals um, for, for these new types. Um, they're easy to define and allow us to write some quite nice expressive code. So this one here works for doubles, um, but you can easily write ones for int, float, etc. So with that, we can simply create a value in grams like that, which is quite nice. In fact, we can go a step further. Um, we can create kilograms and pounds from grams because we've already written the conversion function to convert from one to the other um, using the ratios that we defined. Um, and of course, we can create literals for kilograms and pounds like that. Um, cool. There was quite a lot there. Um, so I'm going to have a quick look at some of the things that we can do with all of that. So. We can define a base type, like gram, for example, and gram is addable and printable. Kilograms and pounds are then both defined as multiples of gram, although pound defined via kilogram. We can create literals for all of them. Um, and then we can create a function, like print mass, that takes in um, a mass in grams, and we can call it, and we can pass in uh, Oh, that's a typo. It should be two kilograms at the bottom. Um, we can pass in some kilograms and pounds, um, and it'll print out the result in grams. And you can do all of that in just a few lines of code once you have the uh, the name type library sort of written up, which is really quite nice. Okay, um, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of real-world use cases for um, for this. Um, the first is from our code at the moment, um, and it uses the name type library. Uh, and the second example is from an internal library I'm working on, and is slightly different. Um, so, for a feature that we worked on recently, um, we had a lot of code that was a bit like this. Um, this is a simplified down version of it. Um, Alice will fully recommend, recognize it. Um, so we had some values representing a set of steps of planes. Um, these values were coming out of the user interface and being passed down into an algorithm and then used to generate some data. And so we have a, a Boolean that represents whether the feature is enabled. We have a thickness in millimeters and an increment in millimeters. And we had a lot of these functions and a lot of these values being stored. And it would be quite easy to call it with increment and thickness the wrong way around. Um, because how would you know? Uh, but more than that, you need to read the types and the parameter names to understand what the API is. The, to that, the second parameter is a double representing a thickness. You can't just look at the type and know what it means. You have to read the name that was given to the variable to understand what it is you're trying to pass in. And you could even have the header and the CPP doing different things. So you could look in the header file and think, brilliant, the thickness comes second. But in the CPP file that uses it, it doesn't. Um, this will compile. This will work fine. This will cause bugs. This will cause lambdas to crash into Mars. Um, so obviously, we could create a struct to hold these values. Um, that would definitely be a step forward. Um, 
it raises the level of abstraction away, it keeps the values together, but you're still setting values into thickness and increments, you could easily put the wrong ones in. Um, so we created strong named types for all three of these um, using the name type library. So now the API looks more like this. We have the type of my that should be enabled. This is not copied from my real code. Um, this is me writing code on holiday. Um, and again, we wrap it up inside the step values. Now, if we try and pass in an increment to a thickness or vice versa, that it simply won't compile. Um, but also, it's more meaningful. Um, as well as being type safe. The code is much closer to the problem domain that we're trying to solve, and it's also much cleaner. Um, in some cases, we still had APIs like this, um, but before we used the strong types, we had to know the names of the variables, as I said, and you maybe had to have docu documentation to explain what those variables are, what they represent, whereas now we don't even need to have names for these variables in the header file. We don't need documentation to say what those names represent. The type tells us what needs to be passed into this API. So I'll look at another example now. Um, this is a library I'm working on at the moment. So we have uh, an old class in our code. Um, it's a, a vector three. Um, and it's used to represent points or vectors uh, in a 3D space um, defined by three coordinates. Um, and this type can represent a location or a direction. Um, it's been in use in our code for well over 20 years. Um, probably C++03 when it was first written. Um, the class has everything you might need for a point or a vector. You can add them, subtract them, normalize them, cross them, dot product them, that kind of thing. Um, and we have another class representing a transformation matrix that allows us to transform points um, or to transform 3.3 three, uh, if you're using a vector, because um, the transform 3.3 three, three doesn't apply a translation, because the vector is just a direction and doesn't have a location. And it means we can write code like this. We can have points P and Q. We can create a vector from P to Q by subtracting one from the other. Um, we can transform them from one space to another. So P nu has been transformed into a new space. PQ new has been transformed as a vector. We can create another one which is PQ new minus Q, which is a vector in one space taking away a point in another one. I don't know what that means, but I've seen code like it. It's a bug. Um, so we've got six vector threes, some representing points, some vectors, some in one coordinate space, some in another, and the compiler knows nothing about any of what I just said. Um, this is clearly right for people to use the wrong transformation, to use vectors from one space with vectors from another. Um, we were literally looking at some code along this kind of lines about an hour and a half ago. Um, it was horrific. Um, yeah, there is no distinction between one coordinate space and another. Um, so we can get the magnitude, for example, of a vector. Both are represented as doubles. Um, we have these nice helpers like dot, cross and norm for acting on vectors, but those same functions are also available if your vector three represents a point. So it's all quite confusing. So I wrote a helper library, um, and this allows us to define uh, our own spaces, um, and it has distinct points for points, distinct types for point and vector. Um, and these types are themselves unique for the coordinate space they're in. So. This is the same kind of code written um, using the library that I created. Um, the X at the bottom will not compile anymore. You cannot subtract a vector, well, a point from one space from a vector in another. Uh, that does not exist as an operation you can do. Um, so again, the compiler is catching bugs before they can go live. Um, because we deal with medical data, we have a space that is the space of the patient, <coughs> and then we display it on a screen, so we have a view space. Um, and the norm, the cross, the dot functions, they don't exist now for points, they only exist for vectors. If we subtract one point from another, we get a vector in the same space representing um, that distance. 
If we add a vector to a point, we get another point which has moved. Everything is suddenly much more understandable. Um, we have strong types for the units. So inside the patient, the, the units are in millimeters, but in view space, you get a unit in pixels, which is more meaningful. Okay, that's me mostly kind of done. Um, I'll just go over some of the points that I've covered in this talk. Um, so types add meaning. They don't just group together data and functions. They are a, a high level language feature that add semantic value to our code bases. Well-defined types allow us to understand our own code better as we create it. Well-defined types allow others to understand our code better. And that other person may well be us in a few weeks, in a few months, in a few years. So by encoding meaning into our code, we encode our intent, we encode our thinking behind the code, and in a way that the compiler understands. And this is far better than any comment or documentation could be. Um, and one of the reasons it's stronger is because the compiler will understand these types and check them for us. Comments and documentation can get out of sync with our code, but the types are part of the code itself and checked by the compiler. Every bit of code that does not compile is one less test case you need to write, one less defect report. We should always try and make our APIs <coughs> easy to use well and difficult to use badly. If we rely on built-in types like int and float, then we risk allowing them to be used incorrectly. And we force the reader of that API to dig deeper into what that API means. They can't just carry on moving through the code. They have to stop and dig into that API. And that slows them down, breaks their chain of thought. That's not good. Strong types tell us what something is and not how it's implemented. We don't need to know that a kilogram is stored as a double precision floating point number. That's an implementation detail, which you can look at if you want to, but it's hidden away. And using strong types, we make sure that it is hidden away. We can write code that's closer to our problem domain. This means that we can think about kilograms, meters per second, etc. if we're writing satellite software, instead of thinking about doubles. We're thinking of the problem at a higher level, using the same kind of language that an end user would, that a business person would. It allows us to build empathy with our end users more. And with a well-written library, we can quite easily create strong types. We're able to create them in a single line and get all the benefits that strong types bring. The library is quite complicated, but it wraps it all away. And other people have already written these libraries for us. So most of this talk was based on work from Jonathan Bakara, um, who I've shamelessly ripped off. Um, these are the links to his blog and his GitHub, and his blog is fantastic, um, all about expressive C++. Uh, and this is Jonathan Muller, um, who has also blogged about uh, the same sort of thing and has a fairly similar library on GitHub, although his goes a lot further to make uh, strong types wrapped around integers that are clamps, that kind of thing. And that's me. Right. Anyone got any questions, complaints? Yeah, um, uh, to go back to the original uh, use case, what yeah. did Martin call a NASA library? Yeah. Um, C++ famously didn't standardize the binary ABI. I mean, if they were calling binary libraries, I mean, you can't use templates on, I mean, you can't, you can't write C++ in that piece here, let's go like XMC. I mean, and then you're back to doubles and ints and all the rest. I mean, is, is there any hope for, for C++ binary compatibility like, to think, guaranteed to use the same compiler on both sides? Uh, let me just try and summarize the question. Um, Lockheed Martin calling a NASA API, um, but how can we know that there was uh, binary compatibility between the API code and the calling code? And is there any hope of C++ standardizing APIs? 
I'm not involved in the committee. I know some people in the room might be. I know there's certainly been talk about this at the committees uh, on having some sort of standard for ABI. Um, but of course, this might not have been across that kind of boundary, this call. It could have been easily built into code that was compiled into the same um, library, or whatever it was that was being compiled into. Um, the same, probably just on a little chip somewhere. But I don't know, anyone know anything about whether how ABI compatibility is going? Uh. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah, there are talks about it. It's difficult because, like most pilots, use the same API apart from Microsoft, <laughs> and they have like millions upon millions of lines of code which they don't want to have to recompile. So, yeah, there's conversations which are happening in the area, but movement is slow. <laughs> Like to see the yeah. TLDR is uh, everyone would like to see it happen, it probably won't. <laughs> uh, yeah, James. Why not make your matrices type safe as well? So I noticed in your kind of example, Olivia, you just had use matrix to do some principle <coughs> and then had a kind of very manual looking and perfect result as here and this. Mm -hmm. I have. Why not put the type of the matrix to go that you're going from patients to view? I actually do in the library, this is a simplified form. Um, I actually wouldn't be using a matrix there in, in my library. I couldn't be bothered explaining that thing I did use. <laughs> but yes. So you have a question? Yes. So, so the, uh, the other direction you go with this sort of thing is to go with the boost unit. That's probably mm -hmm. kind of take advantage of the fact that the SI system is already very well established. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't is, recommend writing kilograms and grams yourself, to be honest. Yes. Yeah. Well, the advantage of this is that you can define like, two incompatible types for mm. length, for example, and then give them like, extra semantic. Mm. So, is there a way that you can get both of those? Like, you can get a full generality so you can do kilograms times the mass. So, the question was Boost already has support for this with Boost Unit, um, but with the library that I presented you can have supposedly incompatible types like feet and inches and meters being convertible from one to the other. Can you get the best of both worlds? Um, I'm going to say yes, but I haven't really put much thought into it. I would hazard a guess that it's probably quite doable. Um, I've not looked into how Boost Unit is implemented under the hood. I'm assuming it uses a very similar scheme to this, but I don't know. Yeah, right, okay, it's not to the audience. This is the. So it probably should be possible to write a, you might write a bit of code to do the conversion, but yeah. It's also possible using the scheme, I didn't go into it here, but the conversion using the ratio um, is, you can abstract that into a function, and you can write a function that will be called when converting from one type to the other. And then you can write code that will do things, for example, like converting decibels to watts, which is a non-linear relationship, but you just have it call a function um, to do that conversion for you. But it's not particularly hard to do, but it's a different type, probably doable. And certainly I would recommend that because Boost Unit is already written and in wide use. So yeah? If I'm working with a philosophy, I'm not convinced I care or want to care whether it's in meters per second or elsewhere or what. Would it not make more sense to have a velocity unit that then wraps up what the actual internal units are? So the question was, if I'm using a velocity, why should I care whether it's a meter per second or miles per hour? Um, why not just use a type velocity? And I guess my response to that would be, if you're passing in a velocity into a thing that's going to change your course, make sure you don't crash into Mars, and you pass in one that you're thinking about as being meters per second, and it's thinking about it in terms of miles per hour, you're going to get a very different result. Yes, but I mean, if the operators for it are wrapped up inside the pipe, so that if you're dividing your velocity by a distance, and both the unit for the velocity and the unit for the distance know what their own units are. It's like having so, an uh, internal canonical yeah. representation. And you only kind of expose what that actually is externally, so things that aren't oh, the internal thing know what to pass in. But, but yeah, you can like probably risk that to the interface. <laughs> yeah. The reason well, I wouldn't like it. Is that when you 
And when you initialize it with a little value, you would have to have multiple constructors that know what type of little value is. When well, you that would it, you would have to have methods yeah. that print in different mm -hmm. units, but with, in between, they could just store their own multiplier. That would work. I guess I would argue against it because if you're reading the code and you see I have a velocity v, it doesn't tell you what that is. It's just a velocity. It doesn't tell you that it's miles per hour or meters per yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 but I don't think you care as long as it's a velocity. It's how it converts itself. I think we care as long as Americans are still not using sensible units. Oh. Sorry, Amazon. <laughs> I know I owe you a whiskey. Uh, yeah, and I think Joe has a question as well, but yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I might have missed this, but is it possible using the named type to describe velocity in terms of uh, meters per second? Uh, because then and you, can make, you can provide a, a, a divisible sort of operation, but it doesn't, from what I, uh, from what I understood, you can't do cross-type division, which is what you'd need to do to describe velocity. So the question was, um, did he miss the part where you convert from, well, I guess, meters and seconds into a meters per second type? Um, no, you didn't miss it. Um, I didn't do it. I glossed over that one, hoping no one would notice. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have to write a specific conversion to have a dividing function that will take in a meter and a second and return you a meters per second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought about you know about you know, Larry's a while, and uh, one of the two brick walls uh, I, or I always found is uh, natural units. So physics would, for example, have to um, use the speed of light as the base unit. And then you get or electron volts, and then you have those giant rational numbers, and we could try to multiply them, you run into more issues, have a other number of problems. Um, and I didn't buy a I found a good way to solve this in a compile time unit salary so far. Mm. So the question was, if you're using units, um, those are often defined in SI in terms of ridiculously big numbers like the speed of light or things like the electron volt, which is tiny. Um, how do you find a way of doing compile time uh, conversions with still work with crazy numbers? Um, I guess it depends what problem domain you're working in. Um, in the field I work in, we don't deal with things that are huge or small. We deal with the human body, millimetres, maybe micrometres is perfectly good for us, up to about a metre. Um, we don't typically need to know where the speed of light is. Um, it will depend on your project problem domain. Um, but yes, I imagine if you are working in a field where that kind of precision matters, yeah, this might be hard. Doesn't really apply to your library because you don't have any cross unit conversions. Um, mm -hmm. But in, with unit systems in general, we might have the problem that the unit might be defined entirely differently. So in the, if you choose something else, then as I, you might have different base units. And something that is a that is a base unit in, in SI it doesn't have to be a base unit in CTS or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also something that is not easy to solve, so you can't just you can't just use um, to have when you have a general when you have a general unit slider, You can't just have seven ints that count up and down, just like we see in that side. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so that's more of a common. No, indeed. <laughs> yeah, you can't express the full range of numbers that you might get in a unit system with a small range of <laughs> floating point numbers. Yeah, indeed. You need to cheat and use a length like Haskell. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the last question. Okay. So to get onto the main type, I think we turned on non constant reference, which the weight of get was seven. Yeah. Was seven. Is it like a deliberate trade off between usability and quality? Uh, it was more a trade off between fitting things on the slides. Um, I, so the. No, oh, please it back. Oh, I suppose. Anyway, um, I think I only had a con single constructor and a single getter. Um, if you look at Jonathan Bukura's um, GitHub, that type has, I think it's got three constructors and a few getters, and yeah, it, it's a lot more complex. It supports, you know, move semantics for the constructors and all that kind of stuff. Non const and const getters, no, not const ref getters and value getters, etc., etc. Uh, I just didn't want to fill that up with too much noise on the slides. Cool. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.